Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about Italian immigrants into the United States and how to trace their lives here in the United States and get them back into Italy. Now, as with uh, just about any ethnic group in the United States, the beginning foundational basics of researching their lives to, dis to discover where in Europe they came from are going to be the same. Um, so we're going to cover that, just some of those, uh, that basic information about how you discover everything you can about them here in this country. Um, and then uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll look at some of the Italian specific resources available on Ancestry.com to help you learn more about them in Italy. Now, I'm going to give you just a brief history lesson because sometimes it helps us to understand the history of um, the, the immigration of a particular ethnic group in order to understand more about who it is that we're looking for and where and why. So according to the uh, 2010 United States Census Statistical Report, uh, about 6% of the United States population, so about 17 million people, uh, self-identified as Italian, which makes sense when you consider that between about 1860 and 1920, which was the, the height of Italian immigration in this country, there were more than 4 million Italian immigrants that came into this country. So um, huge, um, huge population of initial immigrants that came into this country. Um, they spread out across the country. Of course, we do know that large population centers attracted many of them. You have towns along the eastern seaboard um, in particular that have little Italy communities even today. Uh, and so we know that there's a strong population in some of those eastern seaboard countries but, or, or cities, but they did move across the country. Now, a couple of reasons for the immigration. One has to do with unification of Italy. So before 1861, Italy was a series of kingdoms and regions. It was not a unified country. In 1861, um, Italy became a unified country with a central government. Uh, however, southern Italy was heavily populated. Um, the agricultural um, resources available in southern Italy, a lot of people were agricultural, um, were becoming kind of strained. And so their government actually encouraged emigration or they encouraged people to leave uh, because of the strain that southern Italy was putting on the whole country after unification. That was in 1861. Here in the United States, after the Civil War in the mid-1860s, uh, we had more than half a million men who were either killed or wounded during the Civil War. And so that left a huge labor shortage here in the United States, both in the North and the South. We ended up with shortages in agriculture, um, shortages in mining, um, a lot of some of those um, manual labor kind of jobs. And so the United States started recruiting immigrants um, from places like Italy to come and to help with that labor shortage. And so what we see then is not just 4 million immigrants between 1860 and 1920 coming into the United States from Italy, but about 80% of those immigrants come from southern Italy. And that's, like I said, an important history lesson to know because if you don't know where in Italy your family comes from, um, that information uh, will hopefully help you understand that it's very likely that they are from southern Italy. Now, um, one of the reasons it's important to know where in Italy they're from is because of that unification, right? Italy did not become a unified country until 1861, which means records were kept at a local level. So you need to know where in Italy your family is from because there's not a nationwide collection of you know, birth, marriage, or death records like there is in England. Um, you have to know where they're from in order to locate those specific kinds of records. So really big intro, but um, hopefully that kind of history or background helps you understand a little bit about Italian immigration into this country. Let's dive in and talk about some specific basics just about doing immigrant research um, in general, with, and I'll throw in some nuances about Italian genealogy as we go. So, uh, of course, when you're doing any kind of research, but specifically immigrant research, you're going to start with the U.S. federal census. 
From 1900 to 1930, the U.S. federal census recorded an immigration year and a naturalization status. So those are two pieces of information you're going to need to look for on the census and pay attention to. Uh, you'll also want to pay attention to the birthplaces of those children. You can track children born in Italy and then the children that are born after their arrival in the United States to help narrow down some of that information. So if you've never uh, paid attention to or noticed on a... Oh, look, here's a pretty map of Italy uh, before and after unification. Um, I'll show that to you here a little bit closer in just a minute. Let's um, look. start with the 1900 census. If you've never paid attention to where on the census uh, that information is recorded, let me just show you. Now, this isn't the greatest image, um, but I was trying to find a consistent family to show you in the records. So here is a man who is listed as Peter Lombardo in the 1900 census. And if we scroll over here, we're going to see that uh, his immigration year is listed as 1888. And his family's immigration year is listed as 1897. So nine years there um, when he was not with his family. Now there's a couple of interesting things here. First, his um, naturalization status is listed as PA, meaning he has submitted papers to become a US citizen. You'll see up here, somebody else has listed their naturalization status as NA, that means they're naturalized. Down here, someone is listed as AL, which means they are uh, an alien or not yet a US citizen. So PA, NA, AL, those are the three designations. This particular gentleman has PA listed. So 1888 is his immigration year, 1897 is the immigration year of his wife and children. Now, if you look over here, his children are born. Um, his, he's got a 16-year-old daughter born in Italy, a seven-year-old daughter born in Italy. Right, so he came to the United States in 1888. How did his wife get pregnant in 1893 and have a child in Italy? Um, right, well, one of the unique things about Italian immigrant men in particular is that many of them, um, they were considered the migrant workers of their day. So um, there's the phrase that's used to um, talk specifically about Italian immigrants or Italian migrant workers, they were called birds of passage, which meant they would, f they would fly, <laughs> no, they would sail back and forth um, between Italy and the United States repeatedly. So very often they didn't just come to the United States once. As a matter of fact, many of them had every intention of coming to the United States, working, earning money, and then going home to Italy. And some did, some went home and stayed. Some would come back, um, you know, they'd come back and work for a while and then go home and then come back and work for a while and go home and then finally would reach a point where they decided it would be easier just to bring their family over um, and, and settle in the United States. So unlike, um, for example, Eastern European Jewish immigrants who uh, very, very few instances of people who ever went back to Eastern Europe, they were fleeing persecution. The Italians were not fleeing persecution. They were looking for a better economic situation in most cases. And so they would, they would go back and forth. And even once they established themselves here in the United States, you'll, you'll still find them returning sometimes to Italy every few years because they still have family there. They still have connections and ties there. So the fact that this man has a child born in Italy, um, conceived and born in Italy uh, by all appearances, after he immigrated to the United States is no surprise at all because it's very likely that he may have come and gone several times over the course of those nine years. Now they do have then this uh, one-year-old daughter born in New York, um, which says that it's very likely that by then the family was here and settled here in the United States. So again, what you're looking for is immigration year and naturalization status, but also pay special attention to the birthplaces of those children and one of the things that might be helpful is to build a timeline. Um, just in a simple spreadsheet or in a Word doc, just go through and list the years that show up and, and you know, lace in the birth years of those children and make a little note about what those years mean so that you can start to follow um, the information or the pattern of what's happening with this family. On the 1910 census, you're going to see that information um, just in a little bit different location. It's, you know, the columns are all in different orders in different years. So here is the Lombardo family. Um, 
here is um, here he's listed as Petro Petro P E R T R O, and if you scroll over here, his immigration year is listed as 1896, listed as an alien. Um, family immigrated in 1902. Again, that's very common. The father's immigration year is going to be earlier, and then the mother and children are oftentimes going to come later. So look for that. In the 1920 census, this particular piece of information is a little bit closer to the um, front of the line. Here's Pete Lombardo, um, immigrated in 1902 and is listed as an alien. So what it looks like happened here is he, um, he just either the census taker just listed the same immigration year for everybody in the household, or the father went back to Italy and then brought the family back with him. So so pay attention to those things as you look at, and like I said, sometimes it's useful to build a timeline. Um, the challenge with Italian genealogy in particular is that immigration year, um, you're not just going to end up with inconsistent immigration years because they couldn't remember when they came. You could end up with inconsistent immigration years because they came and went multiple times. So that's the little nuance that you need to look for. Now, if they were naturalized, I always encourage people to look for those papers next. That naturalization paperwork um, ha is a complete packet of information. You may have a certificate that your grandfather got, a certificate of naturalization, and that's great, that's good information, but there's more paperwork behind that. In particular, you're looking for um, a declaration of intent. Those are the papers that were filed uh, when they declared their intention to become a U.S. citizen. and Typically, that's going to happen within just a few years after an immigrant arrives. But again, with Italian immigrants, because many of them had no intention of settling here in the United States long term for many years, it's going to, it could be later than you expect it to be, right? As they come and went, came and went from the United States, usually it's not until they bring their family that they decide that they're going to actually settle here. And so you're looking for that declaration of intent also included in that packet will be a petition for naturalization. So those are the two main documents that are in a file of naturalization. Sometimes you'll also have things like a name change document if they made a formal change of their name. Now, not all cha name changes were formal. Sometimes they just Americanized their name or started using a new name. Um, you might also find a certificate of landing if somebody had to verify the passenger list um, on which your ancestor came over. On that, those uh, naturalization, on that naturalization paperwork, there are a few pieces of information you want to look for. One is uh, very often it will list the date, the port, and the ship of arrival. Uh, now, in the case of Italian immigrants, that's most often going to be the last or the latest arrival into the United States. And then if they have a spouse or underage children who are going to be naturalized as part of their naturalization process, they didn't require for um, prior to 1920, they weren't required to naturalize women separately. They gained or derived their naturalization status from their husband. So it will list the spouse and children on that as well as their birth dates and places. We have um, all the circuit, uh, the federal court naturalization paperwork is on Ancestry.com and, and it's going to look something like this, right? Uh, and it's usually going to be organized by state. So you can search by state if you know where they were living when they were naturalized. So for example, here's a declaration of intent. It lists where in Italy he was born. And if you remember, right, before unification, no nationwide records. It's really important to know where they were born. Um, it's also, even after unification, uh, that those birth, marriage, and death records are kept at a local level. And so to know where in Italy they were from is important. And it's important to know where they were from, meaning in this case where he was born. A lot of people, if they say, well, where'd you come from? That's a different question than where were you born. In this case, he actually immigrated to the United States from um, from Genoa. Well, that's because that's a that's a port city, right? Like he's leaving from a place in Italy that's different than where he was born. So you need to pay attention to some of those things. He lists his last foreign residence, um, when he came into the United States, um, which port he came into, and the date. And then over here on this, that was the declaration of intent. Over here on the 
petition for naturalization, he lists his wife's name. And in this case, she had passed away before he became a U.S. citizen. And so he lists her death date and place. So lots of information in these naturalization packets for you to look for. But um, in particular, you're looking for a location in Italy and you're looking for a port and a ship of arrival. Port, ship, and date of arrival. That's the important things to pay attention to. Now you can go searching for the passenger lists. And so when you're looking at passenger lists, again, you're going to be looking um, to corroborate that birthplace information and also in for any information about a last residence. Last residence is sometimes different than the birthplace. And that's important because they may still have family living in their place of last residence. And, and it will sometimes even list the name of the person um, and the relationship. So, my, you know, the, the person in the country where they just left from may be their father and here's his address. And so now you have an additional generation worth of information. Pay special attention to who people are traveling with. And I don't just mean the people that have the same name that are listed on the passenger list one right after another. I also mean the people who are from the same place, who have the same last residence listed on that ship manifest, who have the same birthplace listed on that ship manifest. Very often what happens is, is you end up with groups of people, especially with these Italian, remember again, they were migrant workers, a lot of them, coming and going from Italy. You'll end up with groups of men from the same towns and villages traveling together. They come to the United States, they end up working in the same mine in Pennsylvania, or they end up you know, um, working in the same construction job in New York City, or they end up working, you know, so you end up with these clusters of people who work together who are from the same place. Place. That's important because if you're not exactly sure where your ancestor is from or you can't read it on the passenger list, you can look for some of those other people who have something that looks the same and sometimes it's a little clearer to read. Sometimes it's a little easier to find records about some of them. So, so pay attention to that. Also on passenger lists, it'll very often list who is sponsoring them to come into the United States. Who is it that they're coming to join? Sometimes, especially when you have waves of people immigrating from the same family, you'll end up with like a, an older son who immigrated to the United States with his new bride, and then the father or the brothers come and join that family, and so you get more information about the family. So always look for that information on passenger lists. Um, who they left behind. Um, let's just look at a couple of those. Now again, with Italian immigrants, it's really important to remember they often came multiple times. So here is our Peter Lombard, who um, in this case is listed on a passenger list in 1895 as Pietro Lombardo. Then he's listed again on a passenger list in 1901 as Pietro Lombardi. <laughs> and then he's listed again on a passenger list a few months later. So what you'll see is, again, the, the nuance for Italian immigrants is just because you find your ancestor on a passenger list doesn't mean it's the only time they were listed on an inbound U.S. passenger list. So, so pay attention to those years of immigration listed and recognize that sometimes you will find them multiple times. Of course, the clue or the information on those passenger lists that you have the right person is often going to be some of that connecting information. So in this case, on this passenger list, if I make it a little bit larger here, I have just an entire page of men, um, mostly married men, some of them, well, no, some of them are single, lots of married men, lots, some single men, um, immigrating together, again, probably coming for work. If I scroll over here from Pietro Lombard, Lombardi's um, list, it lists who he left behind, um, or who he's coming to. In this case, he lists he's coming to a sister and her information. And then many of these passenger lists were double-paged. So don't just look at the first page. Note what line number your person is on. So in this case, Pietro's on line four. And then when you click to go to the next image, um, you will see that there is additional information so in this case, here's line four, right? There's additional information on this line very often about the people in that, on that passenger list. So um, make sure you ch always check the second page. Now, not all passenger lists 
are double paged and so um, you won't always have a second page but always check that second page so here's just another example um, here is our Pietro Lombardi he's on page set or line seven uh, come over here to line seven see if there's any additional information okay that's the passenger lists now um, again with Italian immigrants they didn't leave Italy behind. Um, they, you know, it wasn't their intent to come to the United States and never visit Italy again. And so even after they became U.S. citizens, oftentimes they went back to Italy to visit family. And so we have a large collection of U.S. passport applications available online at Ancestry.com. Pay special attention to those because if, you're, if your family member became a citizen and they wanted to go back to Italy, they would need to apply for a passport. So if I look, take a look at those, here is a passport application, and it has information about, again, where in Italy the person was born and when. It also asked for information about the person's father and when and where they were born. There's information here about immigration, when they became a U.S. citizen, where they were living here in the United States, um, information about others who might um, travel in this case and I love this he's going back to Italy for the purpose of to get married <laughs> right so he, he had to get a US passport because he was a US citizen to go back to Pennsylvania or to go back to Italy to um, to get married and then if you look over here some some a description of the person and if you're super lucky, um, sometimes you will also find uh, on the second page, remember always look and see if there's more pages, uh, in this case there is a photo attached to the back of this, uh, pass or this passport application for this gentleman, which I just think is fantastic. Um, I don't know if you can see that really well on your screen. And it's not the greatest, right? This is a, this is a digital image of a microfilm copy of a piece of paper right like so we're talking a second or third generation image here but you get a feeling for um for what he looked like through that particular image so passport applications are, are a gold mine of information and are very uh, fairly common with some of these italian immigrants remember what you're always looking for is a county or province or a town name something more specific to get you to a location in italy uh, remember to think broader than just the immigrant. Pay attention to their spouse, their children, their grandchildren, other family members who may be living in the U.S. or in Italy that are mentioned on any documents. Pay attention to those people they sail with back and forth uh, that might be from some of those same places. When they start, when they settle here in the United States and they start, um, you know, again, most Italian immigrants were Catholic. And so they have uh, witnesses and sponsors to their marriages, to their children's baptisms. Pay attention to who those people are. You might end up with additional family members from that information or just additional information about where in Italy they came from uh, by nature of learning more about some of those additional people they, aff they affiliated with. Of course, there are other records available. There are death records and newspapers and local histories that are created as these people settled in the United States, and many of them worked into um, worked out of some of those manual labor jobs and into white collar um, uh, occupations, and some of them worked into some level of prominence in their communities. Uh, sometimes that first generation, sometimes by the second generation, but sometimes you end up with information written up about them or their children or grandchildren. And very often what it will list is that their you know, roots lie in, and then it will list a specific location in Italy. So always look for other records because you need that information about where in Italy they're from. Now with that, let me just remind you of some of the challenges and then we'll spend our last few minutes here looking at some of the Italian records available on Ancestry.com. Uh, again, just a reminder, some men came to America several times before finally bringing their families over. Um, they, they would come and go and come and go and then um, some people never um, returned like their, their intention was never to settle here so you may find some people somebody here in the United States and then they go back to Italy and they never come back now how did you end up here well maybe they had a son who came over 
right? So you can have a grandfather who lived in the United States for a while, but still died in Italy. Keep that in mind. Just because they came here doesn't mean they stayed here. And then keep in mind that some people Americanized both their first and last names. Um, that was just an assimilation thing that a lot of people chose to do. Uh, it wasn't a requirement. It wasn't something that was forced upon them. Very often it was just a personal choice. Uh, luckily, Italian names are not um, typically too vastly different. For example, Pietro became Peter, right? Matteo became Matthew. Uh, you end up with just some of those slight Americanizations of some of those given names. Sometimes it was just a matter of dropping off a, um, a vowel at the end of a surname in order to Americanize it. So Lombardi just became Lombard. Um, it just depends on how your family chose to Americanize. So be on the lookout again for some of those nuances as you do some of your searches and recognize that that can change over time, right? I've seen records where they were using their Italian name and then an Americanized version of their name and then they were back to their Italian name. So it didn't always stick either. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Now you can search Italian records. Uh, I always encourage people to use the card catalog on Ancestry.com. If you have just a U.S. subscription to Ancestry.com, again, use the card catalog, see what exists online for Italy and specifically for the region in Italy where your family comes from before you make the decision about whether or not to upgrade to a World Deluxe subscription to access those records. Um, it just It's just useful to know if we even have the records that you're interested in. So for those of you who are not familiar with the card catalog, let me close some of my tabs I have open here. Um, here is where you're going to find it. You're just going to hover over search, scroll down and click on card catalog. It's the very bottom option there. Now the card catalog is arranged by, let me make that a little bit bigger. It is arranged by... Um, a few different categories. First is by collection. So if I'm looking specifically for birth, marriage, and death records, I can click on that and it will filter my list. Then it's arranged by location. So in this case, I'm, I can click on Europe and then I can scroll down this list and click on Italy. And this is going to tell me that Ancestry.com has 26 databases online that contain birth, marriage, and death records for Italy. Okay, and so I can scroll through these and I can filter further by a specific region of Italy if I want to do that. So in this case, um, here I can click on Sicily and it will show me that Ancestry.com has eight databases that contain um, birth, marriage, and death records for that region in Italy. Okay, so um, here's Palermo Italian marriages from 1820 to 1895. I can go ahead and open up that database and I can search, search that database. Now, these records are in Italian because they're Italian records, so just keep that in mind. One of the things that I like to do is keep a list of um, words. So I'll go to Google Translate, for example, and I'll type in born, married, died, husband, wife, child, like I'll just type in a bunch of basic genealogy words into Google Translate and then ask it to translate those into Italian. And then I'll print that list out and just keep it with me while I'm doing research in Italian records so that I know that as I'm looking um, at a particular record, um, I know what the information is that I'm looking at. And then I don't even have to read Italian, right? So here is the marriage record for Pietro Lombardi and Maria Barone. Uh, they were married the 23rd of February, 1889 in Palermo. And I can then look at this particular record. Um, it, it has just the basic information, including the names of the parents uh, for the bride, which is fantastic. Uh, I can scroll down here a little bit more, click on the groom's record, and let me just right click and open that in a new tab so I don't lose my list here. Right click on the groom's record and it lists his parents' names. So in this case, it's just an index, but there's very, very valuable information in those particular records. Now, some of the records on Ancestry.com are um, partially indexed, some of them are completely indexed, but you can't always find what you're looking for. If there are images attached, 
they always look for the browse box over here and you can browse to a specific location if you happen to know the specific town your family was from if you know the specific record type you're looking for and if you know the year you can browse directly to a, a collection of records and then just like a reel of microfilm in this case there's only six images um, and the names of the bride and groom are very clearly written in the margins here I can just go image by image through these records until I find the one that I'm looking for. So keep in mind there are some of the records that are not indexed and that's how you're going to need to, to look at them. There, um, some of the records are indexed. If they are, you can just do a regular search. So um, just keep that in mind. Not all records are indexed. If the records are not online, I would encourage you to use the message boards to learn more about the place in Italy, to learn more about what surnames are from that region of Italy, and to learn how to contact the town hall, which is, again, where most Italian records are kept at the town or local level um, for, to access those birth, marriage, and death records. Hopefully that was useful information. It was a lot to cover in not very much time, but um, Italian research is exciting and it's fun. And um, again, that, that nuance of the back and forth and the visiting Italy and the keeping the ties with the family there and the family here um, means that very often you're going to end up with a lot of information about a lot of family members that you're going to have to sort through and make sure that you keep the cousins straight because a lot of times you end up with cousins with the same names and you know make sure that you've got the, the right people but um, but it is it's fun and um, it's it's exciting to look into these records and then to learn more about where in Italy you came from or where in Italy your, your ancestors came from until next time this is Krista Cowan have fun climbing your family tree